Now, today, you've probably figured out that we're celebrating St. Francis. I think the cover of our bulletin gave that away. Francis is certainly one of the most famous and, I think, beloved saints in the Christian tradition, right? And he's famous, I think, especially for, for two things. First, he lived a life of extreme simplicity, right? A life of asceticism. By the time that he was an adult, Francis basically owned nothing except for a robe and a bowl, and that was it. The other thing, of course, that Francis is known for is a peacefulness and a kindness. Francis endeavored to love everyone he met, everyone that he met. And that included not only his fellow humans, but also non-human animals. Fam uh, Francis famously befriended a wolf, for example. Now, Francis himself summarized his whole way of life by saying that all he wanted to do was live the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted to take the gospel message, Jesus' teachings, Jesus' way of life, and actually try to do it. But what a crazy idea he had there. And that's what led him to this extreme simplicity and this extreme peacefulness. But it's important to remember that Francis didn't grow up in a family of ascetic, simple, peaceful people. Indeed, Francis was born into quite a wealthy family. His father was a very wealthy merchant. Francis grew up eating sumptuous meals, living in an elegant home, wearing the finest of clothes. And indeed, early in life, Francis actually served as a soldier. Not very simple, not very peaceful. But in time, as, as Francis reflected on his life and the life of his father and his family, he began to see that this life of opulence, this life that seemed so solid and impressive, that there was a hollowness to all of this. He began to see that his father and he and his family could only live so richly because others were living poorly. His father was making money by taking it from others, by deceiving others, by outplaying others, by not paying his workers enough. Francis began to realize not only did this lifestyle harm those in his community, it also harmed his father and himself. The more they made, the more they thought they needed. He saw in his father this insatiable greed that overwhelmed him and an anxiety that grew up, always worried about losing what they had. Realizing all of this, the hollowness of the life that he was about to inherit, Francis famously renounced his wealth. He walked into his father's study, stripped off all of his clothes until he was completely naked, and then walked out in the streets. A powerful symbol that he was really giving it all up. Of course, in time, Francis would find some clothing, that famous brown habit that many Franciscans still wear today, and he did accept that one possession, just a bowl to beg for food. Early in life, I'm sure that Francis thought that his lifestyle, that his father's lifestyle, that their wealth seemed so solid, seemed so wonderful, but in time he began to see the cracks in the foundation, the, the hollowness of that life, and he chose a different path. And indeed, I, I wonder if perhaps as Francis was preparing to renounce his father's estate, if perhaps he had been reading Jeremiah, perhaps our, our first reading this morning back on page five, because Jeremiah seems to be warning people like Francis and his father about the lifestyle that they've built for themselves, right? Notice the warning that Jeremiah gives us today, quote, Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice, who makes his neighbors work for nothing and does not give them their wages. I think Francis probably began to realize that his house, both literal and figurative, had been built by unrighteousness and injustice, that he was wearing the fine clothes and eating the sumptuous foods because his father wasn't paying those who worked for him what we would call a living wage. But of course, Francis, his father, and his family are not unique. Many human institutions, governments, companies, indeed, 
religious organizations, many human institutions, I think, build up their power and their wealth by unrighteousness and injustice, right? This is all too common in our world. This week, tomorrow, our country will celebrate another famous Italian, but someone with, I think, a rather different legacy than Francis of Assisi. Tomorrow is officially Columbus Day, when we celebrate Christopher Columbus, who's, of course, famous for being the first European to find the New World, the Americas. The thing about Columbus is he's become this important figure in American culture and in American politics. But like a lot of people that are famous in our history, much of what we hear about him is myth and legend rather than fact. For example, we're pretty sure that Vikings discovered, uh, were the first Europeans to discover the Americas centuries before Columbus. And of course, there were people here for thousands, indeed tens of thousands of years before either Viking or Columbus showed up. But that's not the only myth, actually. Our understanding of Columbus is, I think, mostly illusory. I can remember in second grade being taught that Columbus was more or less the first person to realize that the earth wasn't flat. Perhaps you were taught something similar. You were told stories about Spanish and Portuguese sailors warning Columbus that if he headed west, he would fall off the edge of the earth. And we're supposed to remember Columbus as this sort of great intellectual giant that he alone realized that this just wasn't the case, that the earth was more or less a sphere. The truth is that educated people in the Mediterranean basin had known that the earth was a sphere for almost 2,000 years at this point. In the third century BC, some Greek philosophers figured this out and more or less proved it. Columbus's big insight, if we can call it that, was that Columbus was convinced that the earth was a relatively small sphere. And that's why he thought he could travel from Portugal all the way to India in one trip going west, right? Everyone else was telling Columbus this was impossible, that his ship would never make it to India. And of course, all the doubters were right. Columbus showed up on the island of Hispaniola today the island that has Haiti and the Dominican Republic, thinking that he was in India, which was another, I don't know, seven or 8,000 miles to the west. Columbus was wrong. His great insight was incorrect. Everyone told him that the earth was about 24,000 miles at its equator. They were right. The only reason that Columbus didn't die on the ocean was that he bumped into a land that he did not know was there. The myths surrounding Columbus don't end there. He's a figure who does a lot of work, I think, in American culture. And it's probably not too hard to understand why so many Americans would want to celebrate Columbus, even if he wasn't quite as insightful as the storybooks have told us, right? Columbus bridged the old world and the new, at least from the East. It had already been bridged by others much earlier. And there are a lot of people who are proud Americans today who wouldn't be here without Columbus's journey. My ancestry, for example, is entirely English and German. The only reason that I'm not living over in England or Germany today is because Columbus made that voyage. And about a century later, some of my ancestors came over from England. It's understandable that people would want to celebrate that, right? Many of us wouldn't be here without Columbus making that huge mistake and getting very lucky. Not all Americans, though, see Columbus's legacy as a positive one, right? Not everyone sees the presence of so many people from Europe on this continent as necessarily a good thing. Indeed, many Americans tomorrow will refuse to celebrate Columbus Day and will instead celebrate Indigenous People's Day, choosing to remember this legacy, in a sense, in an inverted way. While 
it's not hard to understand why many Americans might celebrate Columbus. I don't think it's hard to understand why most Native Americans would refuse to celebrate Christopher Columbus. And it's not only because his journey ushered in an era of colonialism, disease, and violence that killed maybe 90% of many Native American communities, but also because Columbus himself was an extraordinarily violent man who enslaved a huge number of the Taino people and murdered a huge number of them. Indeed, effectively destroyed their entire civilization. Columbus's legacy, the myths and the legends that we tell about Columbus are a powerful reminder that the history that we often learn in school or through our media, that, that history always seems so solid and so grand. The history of our own nation is always presented as basically inevitable and that we're always the good guys, right? But once we open our eyes and look a little bit closer at this house that has been built, we might discover, like Francis, that our house has been built with unrighteousness and injustice. That's not easy to accept. It's not pleasant to accept. I understand why many Americans don't want to hear that message, but we ought to hear the truth, whatever it is. And indeed, if we look closely, I think what we'll find about the United States is that we have these strange tensions in our identity. We're a nation that prides itself on freedom, and yet we built our power through slavery. We're a nation who constantly defends property rights. I think nothing is more sacred in this country than property rights. And yet our whole nation is built on stolen ground. We're a nation that won't shut up about human rights, and yet we've expanded our borders through illegal warfare and large-scale murder. In other words, our country is deeply hypocritical. The truth is we're not really unique in that. If you poke most countries' history, you find this kind of unrighteousness and injustice. It's fair to say that America may not be that much worse than many other countries, but that doesn't really change anything, does it? I think that most Native Americans and many other people would indeed say that the U.S. is a house built on unrighteousness and injustice, that we're a nation that has not been able to treat our neighbors very well at all. Of course, that doesn't mean that there's nothing to celebrate about our history. It doesn't mean that there isn't anything good about the U.S. There's plenty that's good and that we should celebrate and recognize and hold on to and build upon. But it's easy to remember the good things about our country, about our culture, about our families, about our religious traditions. It's easy to remember and celebrate the good, but we often want to ignore or even deny that there was anything bad, that there were any problems in our house. Sooner or later, though, that truth comes out. Sooner or later, the debts that we owe will have to be paid. We don't have to wait around for that reckoning, though, right? We don't have to wait for the truth to come out inconveniently. We don't have to in ignore and deny those, those truths that we don't want to in here. Instead, we could choose to be more like Francis. We could choose to admit the sins of our families, of our ancestors, of ourselves. We could choose to be honest about what is broken. We could choose to be honest about how often we have built our house on unrighteousness and injustice. And in seeing that, honestly seeing that, we could then choose a different path. I want to encourage all of us tomorrow, wh whatever you choose to celebrate tomorrow and however you choose to celebrate, or indeed whether you choose to celebrate tomorrow, I, I want to encourage you to, to think on this question for at least a little bit tomorrow. What would it look like for the United States to, to really take its debts to Native Americans seriously? What would it look like if we actually tallied up what our nation as a nation, as a community, owes to Native Americans in this country or outside of it? It's a tough question. It's a hard question, a heavy question. 
But I, I think we need to begin to ask that kind of question and to really, like Francis, be honest. Be honest. Take stock of the truth, however hard it is to hear. I want to encourage us to think on that question. And then I want to encourage us, like Francis, once an answer begins to clarify in our minds, I hope that, like Francis, we might even be bold enough to do something with the answer that we arrive at. My friends, may it be so. Amen.